Well, good morning, Bokatov. Thank you. Yeah. I'm ashamed to have to tell you that my country is becoming a hotbed of anti-Zionism. That is tragic considering that Britain was the country most used by God to establish the State of Israel in the 19th and early 20th century. But now in the 21st century, Britain is becoming anti-Zionist. And the minority of us in Britain who support Israel come in for severe criticism. One of the most basic criticisms was that we Christian Zionists are stuck in the Old Testament. Well, the Old Testament happens to be three quarters of my Bible, but I'm not stuck in it. And that's why for the last seven years, I have taken as my subject here, Israel in the New Testament and focused on the unfulfilled prophecies of the New Testament concerning Israel. And I'm going to stay with that theme this morning. My theme this morning is Israel in Galatians. We have looked at Israel in uh, Romans, Israel in Revelation, Israel in Hebrews, Israel in Acts, Israel in Matthew. But a new criticism has come my way after putting all those talks together in a book called Israel in the New Testament. I'm sorry, it's not on sale here, but you can get it on Amazon.com. That's the commercial over. But when people read this book, they said, David, you have particularly selected the books of the New Testament that are sympathetic to Israel. Why don't you choose one of the books that replacement theologians love? So I've done that this morning. And their favorite book in the New Testament is Paul's letter to the Galatians. So this morning I'm speaking about Israel in Galatians. And I'm going to deal with the passages that the replacement boys love to teach, of which there are four in Galatians. I believe the best form of defense is attack. And therefore we're meeting the criticisms head on. And this morning I don't apologize for making you think the most common comment I get after preaching is, well, you gave us something to think about. And it's always said in a tone of mild reproach, as if the last thing Christians want to do is think. <laughs> and as if we don't come to church with our minds. But listen, we're to love God with all our minds as well as all our strength. And I don't apologize for making you think. Indeed, the greatest unexplored territory in the whole world is between your ears. <laughs> and so we're going to love God with all our minds and I will be arguing fairly tightly this morning from Scripture for the support of the people of Israel. Now, having said all that, Galatians is probably the earliest letter of Paul and certainly the hottest. It should have been written on asbestos paper because Paul is surprised, even shocked, and angry. He always began letters with commendation of his readers, thanking God for something good in them. This time, for the only time, he goes straight into rebuke. Not one word of something good in Galatia. Why is he so disturbed and so upset? Now, when you read a letter in the Word of God, you must realize you're only listening to one side of a correspondence. Do you get annoyed like I do when somebody near you is on a mobile phone and you can't hear the other end? and your brain tries to put together a picture and you hear comments on the phone from the person using it and you, you just don't know what's happening at the other end. 
Let me give you an illustration. Hello? Hello, is that you? Has it arrived? Oh, good, congratulations. What weight is it? What color is it? Is it petrol or diesel? <laughs> Now, you see what I mean. You're all trying to construct the other side of the conversation and probably getting it wrong. You can do that with a letter of Paul. You need to listen carefully to what is happening at the other end. Paul only wrote a letter when, when it was needed because it wasn't cheap to find someone to deliver it. And so he was dealing with a crisis and a big one and one that made him very angry and very disturbed. His language is extraordinary in this letter, but your polite English version may not tell you the real language he used. He is cursing people in this letter. In fact, he actually says, I wish they would castrate themselves. Strong language. He's saying, I wish they would rob themselves of their ability to reproduce themselves. Now, why would he wish such terrible thing on believers? The answer lies in a bit of history. The early church was entirely Jewish, especially here in Jerusalem. And that was the root problem. The biggest issue for the early church was circumcision. It's not an issue for us today. We don't take it as seriously as Paul did. In fact, we make jokes about it, and I'm going to tell you one. I have Malcolm's permission to do so. I did try it out on him first, but here's the story. A Gentile man was looking for a faith for himself, and he studied all the world religions, but came to the conclusion that Judaism would suit him better than any. And so he found a local rabbi and said, I'd like to talk to you about converting to Judaism. And they talked for a long time. And the rabbi said, well, you seem very sincere. I think uh, we should go ahead. But he said, I think I should warn you, there is a small surgical operation involved. And the Gentile man said, is it very painful? And the rabbi said, well, he said, I don't remember, but then I was only eight days when it was done to me. But he said, I do know this. He said, I couldn't walk for a whole year afterwards, <laughs> which rather put the Gentile man on. Jokes over. Paul took circumcision very, very seriously. And so did the early church. And the issue was whether Gentile believers in Jesus should be circumcised, should become Jew. After all, Jesus was circumcised, all the apostles were circumcised, all the members of the earliest church were circumcised. And it seemed quite logical to believers in Jerusalem that if you're going to follow a circumcised Messiah, then to be like him, you should be circumcised as well. And this could have split the early church from top to bottom. It was the biggest issue which called the first council here in Jerusalem to deb debate and decide on this crucial issue. Now, Jews didn't mind people becoming like them In fact, Judaism was a missionary religion. The trouble is that if you get circumcised, then you are accepting the law of Moses, all of it, all 613 commandments. You are tying yourself into the law. And the law states that if you break in one single point, you've broken the whole law. That's the law. 
if I'm driving my car in England and uh, I stop at every red light and I observe the speed limit and then just once I ignore a red light and drive through it and I'm stopped by a policeman, I can't say to that policeman, but I've stopped at every other red light. This is the only one I, I've not stopped at. And he will just say, you broke the law. It reminds me of a day when a, an evangelist from Singapore called John Haggai came to London and spoke at the London City Mission, which was headed up by a man called Roy Jeremiah. And they both set off on Sunday morning to go to the church, and they were late, so they were breaking the speed limit, and the policeman stopped them, and he said to the driver, what's your name? And he said, Jeremiah. And the policeman said to the passenger, and what's your name? He said, Haggai. <laughs> and the policeman said, well, I'm, my name is Moses, and you just broke my law. <laughs> But it is, a, it is a fact that if you break one law, just one out of 613, you've broken the law of God. And you've put yourself under a curse. Because there is a curse on those who don't keep all the laws all the time. That's what the children of Israel agreed to at Mount Sinai. God told them his laws and he said, will you keep them all continually? And they said, we will. But the trouble is there's not one of them capable of doing that. Nor have I met one Jew who has done. Well, now what was happening in the early church was this. Because the Jewish believers in Jerusalem were all circumcised, like Jesus, and believe that every follower of Jesus should also be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, which Jesus did. Then they were very worried when Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, told Gentiles, you don't need to keep the law of Moses. You don't need to be circumcised. Believe in Jesus, trust and obey him. That's all you need. And this really upset the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers in our Lord Jesus. And so they would send missionaries because the Jews were very keen on missions. Jesus once criticized them. He said, you, you travel land and sea to get one convert. And they did. They were keen on missionary work. But there was a but. And the but is that when they made one convert, Jesus said, you then make him as much a son of hell as you are. They were sending missionaries out from Jerusalem to follow Paul around wherever he preached the gospel of freedom from the law. They would follow up and say, Paul is not telling you the whole truth. He's telling you part of the truth, which is to believe in Jesus, but he's not telling you the whole truth, which is to be like Jesus and be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And so they were undoing his work. They were not only doing that, they were actually robbing Paul's converts of their salvation because Paul believed you can lose your salvation makes that quite clear in his writings. And his converts were coming to Christ, his Gentile converts, and were then being told, you're not fully converted, you're not fully born again. And then they would be put under the law, which puts you back under a curse if you don't keep all of it all the time. And so he said you should curse them because they are putting you under a curse. He said, you have fallen from grace. In other words, they were following him everywhere he preached and robbing his converts of salvation, making them as much a son of hell 
according to Jesus as they were themselves. Now that's a very serious crisis. And it explains everything in the whole book and certainly explains Paul's deep feelings which come out again and again in this book. Now to give you a very simple outline of the book, there are six chapters, chapters one to two, chapters three to four, and chapters five to six. In chapters one to two, which are largely historical, Paul says, I went up to Jerusalem and I took with me a man called Titus, deliberately took him because he's not circumcised, and I took him as my colleague in evangelism and I presented the church in Jerusalem with myself, a circumcised Jew, and Titus, an uncircumcised Gentile, and said we are both preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And he said Jerusalem accepted our mission. But he said there was a group in Jerusalem called the Circumcision Party, a group of Jewish believers who were still convinced that a Gentile had to become a Jew in order to follow the Jewish Messiah. And Paul faced that party and the elders of this city agreed with Paul. The next part of chapters one to two he describes how he faced Simon Peter himself with inconsistency over kosher meals. And Peter was giving way to the circumcision party by not eating with Gentile converts. And Paul publicly and deliberately rebuked Simon Peter for not being consistent with the gospel. So much for chapters one to two, which are historical. Chapters three to four are doctrinal, where Paul deals with the theology, with the scriptures that were being quoted. And it's in that section, three to four, that I'm going to concentrate this morning. Chapters five to six deal with something quite differently. The danger when you tell Gentiles you are not under the laws of Moses is that they can assume we're not under any law. We can behave as we like. I've just come from South Africa where there's a, a teaching that's rapidly spreading from a place called Hong Kong as it happens and it's called free grace. And they are deliberately teaching Christians you don't need to repent and when you come to Christ, all your sins are forgiven, future as well as past. So it doesn't really matter if you sin now that you're saved. That's a deadly teaching. We call it license. And the two dangers confronting Christian fellowships are legalism and license. And so having dealt with legalism in chapters three to four, he turns to the other problem of license, where he teaches Christians are not free to sin. They are free not to sin. Can I say that again? That's one of the most important things I will say this morning. Christians are not free to sin. We are free not to sin. And that's real freedom. We're the only people who are free not to. Everybody else has to. We're free not to. And therefore, through, throughout the letter, Paul is saying, don't go back into legalism. The law of Moses is legalism. But don't think you're free to go into license. On the contrary. To be led by the Spirit is to be filled by the fruit of the Spirit. Well, now, all that's simply introduction. There are four passages in Galatians which replacement theologians love to quote. I'll just mention all four in summary. The first is in chapter 3, 
where Paul is talking about Abraham and seems to be saying that there's only one seed of Abraham who can inherit the promises made to him. And he quotes that the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. And the word seed is in the singular. And so replacement interpret that as meaning only Christ is qualified to inherit the promises of Abraham. Which means that the Jews are not. That God intended only one Jew to inherit Abraham's promises. And that Jew is Jesus. And therefore, Jesus is the only Jew who can claim the promises of God to Abraham. If that is true, then the whole Old Testament is based on a misunderstanding. Because every time that God promised something to Abraham and his singular seed, he was promising the land to Abraham and his seed. Now, if he was really meaning that only Christ can inherit that, then the Jews have no claim whatever to the land. It means that all the prophets of the Old Testament were mistaken in thinking that God had promised the land to the Jews, to the seeds of Abraham. Actually, it's a very simple misunderstanding. The word seed is what we call a collective noun. It's, the, it's like the word sheep. If I said to you, I must go and look for my lost sheep, that could mean either one lost sheep, which uh, you probably would think of following the parable, but it could mean that I've lost many sheep and I must go and look for my lost sheep. It's a collective noun. It either means one sheep or many. It can mean both. And similarly, when God promised to Abraham and his seed, though it was a singular word, it was nevertheless a collective noun that could mean many. And in fact, God did mean many because he said, and your seed will be more than the dust of the earth so that if you can count the dust, you can count your seed. So a mountain is being made out of a molehill here. And that singular word seed can mean many just as easily as it can mean one. The second passage which the replacement make a lot of is in the same chapter, chapter 3, where Paul says that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. And again, the replacement theologians say that Christ came to abolish all distinctions between people, whether they are racial, social, or sexual. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, it sounds impressive, but in fact, Christ did not come to do away with those distinctions. In Christ, yes, they are gone. But even in Christ, the distinction between male and female still applies. My wife is female and I'm male and we're both in Christ. And she can do things I can't and I can do things she can't. What I can't do that she can I cannot conceive. Sorry, you missed that one. <laughs> Think about it and you'll get it. But you see, why should Paul tell husbands their duty is one thing and wives their duty is different? If in Christ there is neither male nor, male nor female. What's wrong with homosexual marriage if there's neither male nor female in Christ? And that verse, verse 28 of chapter 3, has been seized on by the feminists, by the homosexuals, and seized on to cancel everything else Paul said about the different roles and responsibilities of male and female. 
Similarly, when I came to be in Christ, I didn't cease to be British. And if I tried to tell the income tax authorities in Britain, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, I'm no longer British. I'm going to get in trouble applying for a passport. You see, that verse doesn't mean that Christ has come to do away with all distinctions between Jew and Gentile, for example. That verse is dealing with our vertical relationship to God, not with our horizontal relationships with each other. Our horizontal relationships, we are still Jew or Greek. We're still male or female. We're still slave or free, as the letter to Philemon underlines when Paul sent a runaway slave back to his owner. But in Christ, in my vertical relationship with God, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And the word one there means we are one person. We're not many people anymore. In Christ, we are one person. And he's Jewish. And he's male. And he's free. And we have adopted his identity as far as God is concerned, I'm in Christ and so is my wife. And therefore, my wife is a son of God, not a daughter. Because we have been baptized into Christ, we've clothed ourselves with Christ, we are in Christ, and therefore we are in God's sight, one person in Christ, Jesus. We have adopted his identity. Therefore, in Christ, I'm a Jew. And in Christ, I'm male. And in Christ, I'm free. Because he wasn't Gentile, and he wasn't female, and he wasn't a slave. So that's the meaning of the verse. We have put on Christ. And that's why when I pray, I can pray in his name. When you say at the end of a prayer, in the name of Jesus Christ, what are you saying? You're saying, this isn't me, God. This is your son asking. I'm adopting his name for this prayer. That's why it's such an incredible privilege that we should not reduce it to a formula at the end of a prayer. You're saying, God, this is Jesus praying. I'm in Christ, and I'm using his name to pray. What a difference that would make to what we prayed for. Well, now that's the second passage, but it's the third passage that I want to spend most time on. And if you have a Bible, please open it at Galatians chapter 4. And this is perhaps the second most important passage in Galatians to the replacement theologians. Beginning at verse 21, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way. But his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively. Actually, in the Greek, Paul says allegorically. For the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai to the present uh, in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. 
For it is written, be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. At that time the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Now, what's all that about? First, I want you to notice who he's talking to. He's talking to Christian believers who want to live under the law of Moses. You may think that's strange, and yet today I meet Christian Zionists who want to do the same thing. Put yourself under the law of Moses and you put yourself under a curse. But there are Christians who want to do it. Why should anyone want to live by the law of Moses when you've found the liberty of the Spirit in Christ? There are two big reasons. One is that uh, it's an attractive thing to do. It's an appealing thing to do. It's far easier to be told what to do by laws than to be led by the Spirit. Much easier to be able to go to the rabbi and say, what should I do in these circumstances and be given the law than it is to find out what the Spirit would want to do. It's much easier, easier to tithe your income according to the law of Moses than be led by the Spirit as to what you give. Much easier to live by law than to live by the Spirit. And so people want to know exactly what they should do in each circumstance. Most of the questions I get asked, I'm being treated as a lawyer. And people want me to lay down the law for them as to what a Christian should do in these circumstances. I usually refer them to Haggai 3.16 or whatever it is, which doesn't exist. <laughs> But we, we want the law to tell us exactly how to live. But we are called to be led by the Spirit. And that, I find, is much harder. Much easier to be told what to do. That's one reason why people are attracted to a religion of legalism, to a religion of law. The other reason is that you can do it yourself because it hints that if you do this, then you will inherit eternal life. And that feeds our pride. We'd much rather have a do-it-yourself religion than one that's done for us, much rather. It feeds our pride. Every religion in the world except Christianity is based on what you should do for God. Christianity is based on what God has done for us. That's a big difference. It's the difference between law and grace. But human nature prefers law. We'd rather do it ourselves. We'd rather achieve our own righteousness than have God give his righteousness to us. That's, that's human nature. And that's the biggest problem for God because there's one thing God cannot stand. It's self-righteousness. And it was the Pharisees who were most in conflict with our Lord Jesus over this very thing. And he told his own followers, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom. So the Jewish religion and the Jewish laws appeal to human nature. Many would rather have that. And so Paul addresses those in the churches of Galatia who are listening to these Judaizers from Jerusalem and who are adopting 
Judaism who want to live under the law, who prefer to do so. I meet Christians today who prefer to worship on the Sabbath than on Sunday. What a terrible error. The Sabbath looks back to the old creation. Sunday is the beginning of the new creation. It's the day when God went back to work. Quite different. But we are drawn to behave like Jews. There's something in us admires Jews and would like to be like them. Please, I beg you, if you're a Gentile, praise God that you're a Gentile. You don't need to become Jewish. And praise God that he didn't tell you to be circumcised or to keep any of the laws of Moses. We only keep the law of Christ and his reinterpretation of the law of Moses is binding on us. But we gladly submit to that. It's because we love the Lord Jesus that we keep his commandments. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's where we stand. We are free from the law because Jesus died to the law and in Christ we have died to it as well. The law can't touch dead people, but Christ can and does. Well, now let's move on. Paul begins with facts and he goes to the Torah for these facts. Like Jesus before him, he appeals back from Moses' part of the Torah to God's part at the beginning. He goes back to Genesis. When Jesus was asked about divorce and remarriage, he said, Moses allowed it, but I don't. I go back to Genesis. I go back to God's intention and what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Paul is doing exactly the same thing He's appealing from the Mosaic part of the Torah back to God's part in the book of Genesis. And he says Abraham had two sons. Actually, he had eight, but we're mainly concerned with the first two. The first was Ishmael and the second was Isaac. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son, but by the wrong mother. And Abraham tried to hurry up God's program. What a mistake. Or rather, I think it was Sarah. When God promised a son to Abraham, Sarah said, I'm years past childbearing. You'll have to do something else to get that son. I can't produce a son for you. She genuinely thought that. She said, go and take one of my female slaves. A fertile young woman can produce a son for you. And she did. But that son was not God's promise. It was a human birth achieved entirely by humanity. Abraham was still able to impregnate her and he did. And she was still able to have babies and she did. Now these are the facts on which Paul is going to build an extraordinary teaching. He says, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman, by Hagar and Sarah. And then he says, we can treat this allegorically. Now we Zionists are a bit scared of allegory. That's mainly because the replacement Theologians have allegorized the unfulfilled promises to Israel and changed them from a literal meaning of coming back to the land to a spiritual meaning of blessing the church. So we've got scared of allegory. But there is allegory in the Bible. Some of it is allegory. I don't take the whole Bible literally and I've never met anyone who does. If you do, you've made a big mistake. I take literally what the Bible intends to be literal and I take allegorically what the Bible intends to be an allegory. 
For example, I don't believe for one moment that there will be a scarlet woman riding a dragon. It's in the book of Revelation, it's in the word of God, but I don't take it literally, nor I hope do you. It stands for a city in the grip of Satan, the city of Babylon. And so that's an allegory. And the important thing is where you draw the line. And you cannot take the whole Bible literally. Otherwise, there are only going to be animals in heaven and hell, sheep in one and goats in the other. <laughs> but you don't take that literally, do you? Of course you don't. The sheep and goats stand for people. It's an allegory. And here Paul is saying, those facts I've just told you are an allegory. Those two women, a slave and a free woman, Hagar and Sarah, represent two covenants. One Hagar represents the covenant made at Sinai with Moses, and it leads to slavery. You become bound to Moses' laws, all of them. And I'm breaking some at this moment while I stand here. There's a label in here that says this is mixed cloth. And the law of Moses says you mustn't wear mixed cloth. So you've got a preacher this morning who's breaking the law of Moses. It doesn't worry my conscience because I'm free from that law. And many of the others. If I had a rebellious son, I wouldn't kill him, but Moses said I should. I'd try every other way. Well now, Hagar stands for the law given at Sinai, whereas Sarah stands for the freedom of a supernatural promise. And those are two covenants. I've already given them character. One covenant emphasizes what you have to do for God. The other covenant emphasizes what God can do for you. Hagar and Sarah. Hagar could do it herself, and she did. She didn't need God's help to do anything. She produced a son for Abraham in the natural, ordinary course of events, as anybody else could. Sarah couldn't do that. You know, when I read through Genesis 11, it seems that people did nothing but begat in those days. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. All they did was begat for long, long time, and then suddenly at the end of the list, but Sarah was barren. She was infertile. She couldn't produce a son for Abraham. Not possible at 90 years of age, no way. But she did, because God enabled her to do so. Because God had a promise to keep and he kept it. Now, Hagar stands for the natural man who loves the covenant of law because he wants to do it himself and because he thinks he can. But the covenant of Sarah is what God can do for you. One is a covenant of self-righteousness. The other is a covenant whereby God gives us his righteousness. Not only that, but here comes the reason why I'm majoring on this passage. He says, Jerusalem belongs to Hagar. Now the implications of that are so profound that I almost dare not tell you in the context of this uh, week, focusing on Jerusalem. But according to Paul, and this is the word of God, this present Jerusalem belongs to Hagar. And we must explore the implications of that in a moment. He's saying that spiritual DNA is important. Now the replacement theologians use this as a basis for criticizing Christian Zionists. They say we are far too concerned with the earthly Jerusalem and we're not concerned enough with the heavenly Jerusalem. 
for the two women stand not only for two covenants, but for two cities. And both have the same name. One is on earth, and we're in it at the moment, the earthly present Jerusalem. The other is the Jerusalem that is above. There's another city up there. It's going to come down here one day, but it's up there at the moment. And it's that city to which I belong, and to which you belong. And the replacement people criticize us for putting too much focus and attention on the wrong city. And I'm going to say in a moment, there's truth in their criticism, but not the whole truth. And I want to tell you what is wrong with their criticism, and then tell you what, sorry, what is right about their criticism, and then tell you what is wrong with it. We need to listen carefully to our critics. Otherwise, we are living in our own little world, listening only to ourselves. Now, I'm afraid I have to confess that I have given more attention to the earthly Jerusalem than to the heavenly one. But she is my mother, not this one. I don't owe this city anything. I've never heard anybody healed in the name of Jerusalem, have you? I've never known anybody saved by the name of Jerusalem. By the name of Jesus, yes. By Jerusalem, no. This city. Paul said, this present city belongs to Hagar. What did he mean by that? He said it's a city of slavery. Now, is that still the truth? The answer is partially. It is still true that the vast majority of the citizens of this city are in slavery. In Paul's day, they were in slavery to the law. That is not true in our day. A minority of Jerusalem is still in slavery to the law of Moses. If you want to meet them, go to the Mir Shiarim or go to the Western Wall on Friday night. But the majority of citizens of this country are no longer in slavery to the law. They still may take a day off for the Day of Atonement, but they're not in slavery to the law. What are they in slavery to? The answer is the same th slavery that we used to be in, slavery to sin slavery to themselves, and they need libera liberating. Tomorrow you will go on the march through Jerusalem. I beg you, don't be deceived by the wonderful reception you will get. I remember my first march through Jerusalem behind the Israeli Defense Army. The soldiers were at the front of the procession. We came at the back in those days and the welcome we received we were delighted with people's faces lit up but I want to tell you the truth they will not be welcoming you as ambassadors for Jesus they are welcoming you as supporters of Israel and they're glad to have that support they are a very lonely people and it looks as if it's boiling down to Christians as the only supporters of Israel outside Israel. That could be the final end of the present trend. But when you see their faces, just remember, spiritually they belong to Hagar. They're born of a slave woman. They belong to that old covenant of Mount Sinai. You see, even Christians can be deluded, deceive themselves into letting the physical factors override the spiritual. When we look at the physical DNA of the people in this land, we see two people. We see the descendants of Israel, the Arabs, of Ishmael, the Arabs, the descendants of Isaac, the Jews. But that's not how God sees them. 
God looks on their spiritual ancestry. And when we do that, we find there are seeds of Sarah among the Palestinians. And we had one speaking here from this lectern yesterday morning, Naim from Bethlehem. He is, his spiritual mother is Sarah. Most Israelis are children of Hagar, spiritually, but there are children of Sarah among Israelis. And just as Paul said, Ishmael troubled Isaac, so the descendants of Hagar and of Ishmael on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian divide caused trouble for the children of Sarah. And we need to recognize this. To say simply, Arabs are children of Ishmael and Israelis are children of Isaac is a mistake. Most Israelis are children of Hagar, spiritually. And still, though one day, God has promised to lift the blindness and bring them into one fold with us and we look forward to that day. But you see, it, it makes a total difference when you no longer see the Israelis as children of Sarah or the Palestinians as children of Hagar. The majority on both sides are still children of Hagar, so don't be deceived. You may ask a very simple question and I'm going to answer it. Why go on a march through Jerusalem? There are very profound reasons why it's a good thing to do. First, you are undoing the prejudice of 2,000 years. Jews have long memories and they cannot forget easily the anti-Semitism of the Christian church over centuries. We are marching to show them that some Christians love them. Some Christians are not like those who kill them. Some Christians want to love Israel. And the biggest thing we're going to tell them is this. Even if you are enemies of the gospel for our sake, you are still beloved by God for the patriarch's sake. I'm quoting Romans 11. So you are going to say, we love you, and you are going to say, God loves you. But you're not going as evangelists. Indeed, it would be wrong for you to be giving out gospel tracts or putting the name of Jesus on your banner. You're not going to evangelize. The march isn't about that. It cannot be. Indeed, if you went through Jerusalem with Yeshua HaMashiach on your banners, you're asking for a riot. But you're not going for that. You're going for what I call pre-evangelism. You're going to soften hard hearts. You're going to prepare them to think again about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you go. But don't be under any illusions. They're welcome to you. They're not welcome you as evangelists. They're not welcome you as ambassadors for Jesus. They welcome you as friends of Israel because they desperately need support and are so glad to find it anywhere, and surprised to find it among Christians in view of our dreadful history of anti-Semitism over the years. So there is truth in the replacement criticism of Zionists. We do get too excited about the present Jerusalem, and we do tend to be naive in the welcome they give us when we march. And we do tend to get mixed up between the earthly Jerusalem and the heavenly. We belong to the heavenly. We owe our salvation to Jesus who is in heaven. And we are citizens of the Jerusalem that is above. We're not citizens of this Jerusalem. But one day this Jerusalem will be replaced by the one that comes down from heaven. And I look forward to the new Jerusalem. So having said there is truth in their criticism, let me now say there is error in their criticism. 
the replacement attitude to the present Jerusalem is neutral. The only reason that would bring them here is the past, to see where Jesus was, where he was crucified, where he was buried, where he ascended. That's all past. And we need to remember that Jesus wept over this city. We may smile and laugh, but as I marched through Jerusalem for the first time, my heart was breaking. I was weeping inside. I was laughing outside and smiling outside, but inside I was weeping. How often he said, would I have gathered you as a hen gathers the chicks beneath her wings, and you wouldn't. You wouldn't. And they still wouldn't. Actually, I believe that Jesus has even more to weep over this city now with all the multitude of denominations that we've introduced. What a picture of Christianity we give to this city. It's enough to make Jesus weep all over again. But he still weeps for his people. His Holy Spirit is still grieved by the inhabitants of this city. They still live in slavery to themselves. They still reject his liberation, his freedom. So don't be deceived. And thank God for the heavenly Jerusalem to which we belong. She is our mother. Now let me come back at the replacement. I accept their rebuke. I think there is truth in it. And we need to take notice of it. But there is also error. They have little or no room whatever for the Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem of the future. And this is what makes the total difference for me. I do not come to Jerusalem for its present. Its present state is grievous. But I do come for its future. This is central to the Lord's plan for the whole world. It is here that Jesus is coming back to planet Earth. And you know, I was in debate, public debate, with the leading anti-Zionist in Britain. And I asked him, do you believe that Jesus is coming back in his resurrection body? And he said, yes, of course I do. I said, then where is he coming back to? Because if you're in a body, you can only come back to one place. You can't come back to the whole world at once. You've got to come back to one place. And he didn't know. Had no idea that Jesus was coming back here. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And that makes the future of this city very important to me. There's a, a church in London called... Um, the temple, it's in the Strand in London, and there are effigies, marble statues on a whole lot of tombs of the knights who came to fight the crusade in Jerusalem. I'm not proud of the crusades, but I'm very glad to see that every marble effigy on the tomb is 33 years old. No matter what age those knights died, their tombs represent them as 33 in the resurrection. And I'm going to be 33 again. Hallelujah for that. <laughs> and it's here, it's here in this old city that I will receive my salvation from Jesus. Notice I said I will receive it. I'm not saved yet. I'm on the way of salvation. The New Testament uses the word save in three tenses, past, present, and future. You have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. But the emphasis statistically is on the future. Our salvation is not ours yet. It's coming, and it'll come to me right here. Now you've gone quiet, nobody's clapping, nobody's saying hallelujah. So I better explain. No, don't do it because the preacher says so. Amen? <laughs> Let's listen to Paul. Paul says in Romans, 
our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Isn't that a lovely text? Did you ever hear it preached on? Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I'm looking forward to being saved. It's nearer than when I first believed, 60 years ago or more. Listen to the letter to the Hebrews. Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to bring salvation to all who are waiting for him. And I'm waiting for him to bring me salvation. And he's going to do it right here in this city. Thank you for listening.